as we go through. So uh, That's what I, I, uh, to do. I I'll hand over now to Michael Carty, who, who will chair the session. Okay. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for being here this afternoon. As Simon said, the aim of this particular forum is for participants to have the opportunity to discuss companies' English language needs and the identification of, um, if you like, the real world language skills required by companies. And, you know, I think we all accept the fact that this is becoming a global challenge and not specific to one particular part of the world. <laughs> Just a little bit of housekeeping before we move on. Um, Simon already mentioned we have four speakers and we thought it's best if we break up the sessions into a 10 minute session by each, a 10 minute presentation by each of the presenters. And we can have five minutes between presentations for questions. And um, anybody on the committee can address these questions as they feel fit to do so, yeah? Do forgive us if we don't allow more than five minutes at that particular stage and move on because there will be an opportunity right at the end of about 45 minutes for us to uh, have a further discussion on any of the issues that have been raised and the new issues you wish to raise. As I've been asked to chair this meeting, this panel, one thing I do not wish to do is to actually run over my 10 minutes slot. So I'm just timing myself, if you like. Mm -hmm. I think it's widely accepted that English language and business English is likely to continue to grow. It's going to continue to become increasingly important right across all industries and organizations, at all organizational levels, and in almost all parts of the world. So I think the importance of responding to this development should not be underestimated. But what is business English? I think business English originally was coined to target a specific group of people and these were people in the workplace and they needed a special, if you like, variety of English in order to perform their duties. But today, business English means very different things to different people. For example, when we're talking about business English, are we talking about general business English? Or are we talking about English for specific purposes? Or are we talking about business English for academic purposes? The latter, uh, primarily referring to I think it's fair to say pre-experience um, target group, yes? So the, we, we do have a variety of categories today that are classified under the general term business English. Some, I think some issues that we could examine today and hopefully we'll be able to pick up on afterwards include, do business English courses provide the skills that adult learners need today? Perhaps this is key for corporations, for providers, teachers, and particularly for the individuals themselves. How can business language requirements be addressed? And what are the implications for a company if they are not? Are there implications? Is it really that important? 
and business English versus general English. And are we getting it right? So we'll also touch, of course, on managing students' expectations, because I think that's an area that we have to face very often when addressing business English as well. So, do business English courses provide the skills that adult learners need today? Today there's a wealth of material courses on the market. And I think it's fair to say that we've come a very long way in the last 20 years. There's a lot of material which is very well presented, written by people who have a wealth of experience in the area of teaching business English. There are tailor-made courses which try to get to the heart of the needs of the companies and individuals in business English. So I think it's fair to say that, yes, there is a lot of material there that would make one believe that these, in these days, they can actually be provided with the skills necessary. As we said, a lot of good materials, a lot of good courses, a lot of hard work put in by teachers. So it's perhaps a little bit surprising when we see the results of a survey carried out about two years ago, mainly in Europe and Asia. And these were the results of the findings of the survey. That only about 7% of workers strongly agree that the current level of English is sufficient to enable them to do the job. I think that I was surprised, yes? 92% say that English is important or is required in their jobs. So, what's the reason behind this? Is it about managing students, learners' expectations? Do they have very high expectations of what they can do in a short period of time? Is it about self-confidence and the the feeling of secure, of secure feeling they've got rather in their abilities and capabilities in the language? Is it a mismatch between what we're actually giving the learners and what they expected to get out of it? I think that's a very interesting point and that's perhaps something we can discuss later on. It's good to get everybody's views on that. What I think most people would agree on is the following, that in order to address the business language requirements, the organizations need to have access to the right tools and training. I think that's the starting point. That business English programs should be easy to implement, easy for the employees to get started, keep employees motivated, and quickly enable performance and productivity gains. I think these are, if you like, what we call the essentials. I would like to add to that, because I think it's equally important that what's important for anybody providing or engaging with business language requirements in companies or with individuals is to know the organization or the individuals you're dealing with. I think that's extremely important. Equally important is knowing your learners and your clients. Knowing what they know and knowing what they don't know is also important. And also managing expectations. And perhaps, you know, this is an area that we need to look at more. But the teacher, the provider, the tutor, the course provider is there to guide very often. And there's perhaps a need for clarity of roles. I'm here to guide, but I need your help. And we mustn't forget that many of these business English students bring to the task a lot of information that we may not have ourselves. 
I think also that an issue we perhaps need to look at more is that we need to involve the students themselves far more in the whole process, and particularly in developing the curriculum, if we were to avoid, if you like, disappointments and feelings later that they're not getting what they thought they had set out to achieve. So perhaps involving them in the curriculum, perhaps they should be involved. And what I mean by that basically is, one way around that would be, for example, to give them a list of topics and areas to cover, and they prioritize. And this may change as you go through the course, of course, as the needs and priorities become more evident. But perhaps that is one approach to make them feel that this course is indeed something that I have asked for, or I think is important to me. Today's companies, I think we find more and more so that today's companies are seeking talent. And if you like, they compete for that talent, and English is very much part of that talent we're looking for today. English is a factor in recruitment, uh, it's a factor in engagement, deployment and retention of staff. And I think businesses now realize that without the appropriate language skills, they have a lot to lose in today's world of globalization. This was an interesting um, article I came across and shows how indeed companies can lose out if they are not, if you like, aware of their needs and if they haven't got access to the soft skills and that kind of talent. When we talk about business English, are we talking about are we talking about um, only five minutes left? Okay. Are we are we talking about um, a specific separate category of English, or are we talking about general English and a mixture with business vocabulary? Yeah. I think that is one of the questions that people ask themselves very often. Teachers very often are scared of business English because they feel, oh dear, I couldn't cope with business English, although I can cope very well teaching general English. Uh, I, I read a, a, an article by Marjorie, which I thought was very useful, and I've actually taken the liberty of using Marjorie's list Marjorie created a Venn diagram. And what it clearly shows is, if you like, the overlap between business English and general English. And it's just interesting to have a look at Marjorie's list here. So, I think what it goes to show is that indeed there, are, there is common ground and of course if you do want to um, feel that you go to learn about business English, I think you need to look at at what stage do you just become more of a business English course. Marjorie also made an important point in her article saying that if you're teaching general English, yes, why do you feel you cannot take over bring into the business class some of the activities that are actually fun in the business language classroom, which I thought is an excellent point to make. Yeah. What I would also ask us to think about today is, if, do you feel that general English learners are actually if you like, shifting, are they becoming more demanding? I have a feeling that they're becoming more demanding. They're more focused on what they want, and what they want to do with English. 
perhaps the more goal-oriented. Why? Maybe it's because they have more opportunities to travel. Maybe it's because they have far more, if you like, opportunities to use the English they're learning. And perhaps they, they are finding themselves more and more in situations which they might not have imagined 10, 15, 20 years ago. So what I asking today is, we have seen the business English as, if you like, business English class is more serious. But perhaps the general English class is becoming also more serious. In other words, they want results. Perhaps they need now to send emails to contacts and friends. Perhaps they want to be able to complain. Perhaps they want to be able to exchange money. Perhaps they do want to take taxi and book taxis. And this has become a real possibility rather than a hypothesis in the classroom. Current affairs. So the question is, do we find that general English students are actually becoming closer to the needs of the business English students in some ways? So it's just interesting to examine that. And I need to finish on, are we getting the balance right? Okay. Well, that's the question we just asked. Are the needs of the corresponding age group of general English learners coming close to the business English learners' needs? Now, of course, it is true that the business English learner needs something different from the typical English required. And that the pedagogy and content needs to be powerful and based on recent research. And that these are workers developing skills, not for their own sake, but because the company requires it. Okay. But they must be, if you like, given opportunities to develop the skills that are relevant to their particular context, if possible. Yeah? And focus on real life situations, I think, as we've mentioned, emails and their daily needs. So, how far have we come? I'm using a quote here, and I think that we have come a long way, as I said earlier. But the road to success is always under construction. And I think we still have quite a long way to go, um, as in almost every aspect of teaching. Thank you, and um, I'll hand you over to Mr. Nikos and Stanitsis, who will now talk about the corporate sector and the requirements of the industry in Croatia and what they're looking for when they're thinking about recruitment, promotion, and empowering staff. Sorry. Thank you, Marjorie. We said we, we, we have changed the program, we're going to have questions, so we have a five minute question slot. Thank you. Great, so you've mentioned what the average time between the Oh, sorry. You mentioned what you know, the common point between uh, general English and this uh, yeah. business English is different vocabulary, but the functions are not the same. You've mentioned grammar and functions are the same, but they're not the same, are they? And no, we, what we're saying is that uh, in, in, in this list that Mark has put up here, you'll see that uh, <coughs> many of the functions and grammar, many of them, there is an overlap. So we use the word overlap, yes? But of course, you will use different functions in, in um, you would define the function different in business English, perhaps, yes? But I think the overlap is great enough to say that what you're dealing with are the specifics of the function rather than the core. Mm -hmm. If you're yeah, thinking like that, there would be overlapping everything. Just vocabulary you might be overlapping, grammar might be overlapping. We cannot have a boundary that this is just the grammar, just for business English. Mm -hmm. We cannot ignore that some other vocabulary items can be overlapping as well. So why do we put it in this, this special this space, for example? Mm -hmm. The idea was that there are functions that sometimes overlap. A request in general English could be the same as a request in business English. You might say it a little differently. But the idea is to show that there is a certain amount of overlap, and then there are areas that are completely different that you would not do in one or the other. Grammar is also 
in many cases, I mean, students who need to learn conditional sentences in business, the vocabulary will be different, but the structure of the grammar is most likely going to remain the same. That was my point. Is that what you wanted to ask? Yeah, the question, uh, my question was, why do you, if you say vocabulary has the same Sorry, I, 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 I don't want to sort of rephrase your question, but I think uh, it's because the speaker is not very loud and we can't hear. I, I think uh, your point was uh, why didn't we include vocabulary in this overlap? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and, and it's, it's a very good point. I think it was just you, it's so evidently correct what you say. That, uh, yes. The reason was that we teach different vocabulary in business English than in general English. But a function is often an overlap, and the grammar for me is an overlap. That was the, the main thing. But this was just a guideline, kind of an idea of what, for me, where the main differences and the overlaps came. But the vocabulary is certainly different when you teach specialized vocabulary. I do not need to teach assets and liabilities in the general business, uh, in, yeah, in general English, for example. But I do need to teach it in business English. Does that? Lower levels of business English students of elementary, for example, they don't need to, to learn any general vocabulary. Yeah, I, I think that is the point that they would. Students? Yeah. No, I think um, the the starting point was that uh, I think it was mentioned at some point that the earlier on people are starting out on the course, whether they call it business English or whatever. <coughs> And the more you will find that it's a more general English course rather than very business specific. And you're quite right, you know, the functions are very basic. I would just say that, you know, with something like a function, let's, well, let's take an example, you're teaching someone to answer the phone. Yeah? And how different is that in business English? It is slightly different. At home you might say, hello, John, this is John, etc. And when you're teaching that in a business English course, and particularly for teaching to a particular company, you probably want them to practice answering the phone with the name of the company. Hello, this is John Smith. The name of so I, I think, you know, you're, I, I don't think there's a disagreement here. I think what, what you're saying is, 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 is basically what the um, driver tried to show was that <laughs> this overlap is actually probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, Marjorie, is probably a good way to show students that you don't have to divide them in your mind completely that this is business English. I mean, you, you, you've been teaching business English a long time. When I, when I um, dealt with business English students, adults, what surprised me very often was that they might be quite competent in the whole field, but they couldn't transfer that into a general English, um, if you like, framework. And they were very reluctant to speak about um, current affairs or anything outside their own working sphere. And I think this was probably down to my mistakes as well as allowing them along the road of thinking that this is a separate category and really those two things are very different. And I, and I think we need to make people realize that they're not that different, but obviously there are additions that you need for business English. Um, I don't know if, if Thank you agree with that. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. I, I wonder how you perceive the role of the trainer, given that the trainer in the future might become more of a guide to the student uh, rather than a teacher in the accepted sense. What are the implications for the role of the uh, trainer? So, yes, I, I mean, it, it's an interesting issue, and I, I, I'll tell you what, can, I, can we come back to this at the end of my talk? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it is a very interesting question, because there are implications, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing that springs to mind is um, some ability at coaching skills because it seems to become more appropriate. And we are seeing some of that area coming in, in business English teach training, I think. 
And perhaps at the end, we, can, we, we, we will come back to it because um, one of the things that I've been involved in the past is actually teaching over the telephone. So you can imagine, if you like, the, the practicalities involved there and, and the distancing there and what you said becoming much more of, of being able to guide rather you know, than... Um, Fine, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I think we move on to our next speaker then. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, hello to everybody. I'm not any kind of expert in English language. I just came from industry and I can tell you about my experience with English language. This is closely also uh, related with business English and basic general English language. I can state just that uh, something which is common, uh, common point in this era of globalization, this is English language because everybody in the world, each country, each industry, each businessman is speaking English. Doesn't matter do we like that or not, but that's, this is the fact. <laughs> also, uh, here uh, I heard something about difference between business and general English. From my experience, uh, I know that we always, when we started uh, this with the English courses lesson, we always have a vice versa relations between student and professor. Sometimes when you have experienced engineer or some expert from finance or whomever, then that person can be a professor to the professor and to, to teach some uh, words, some wording uh, which professor doesn't know because he's not expert in that field. So we very often, not often, always when we finished with training lessons, then we made a questionnaire with all participants and then we asked what was good, what was bad, where is position for improving for the future year, for future generations and then when we collect this data from this questionnaire, then we present to the professor and then we try to understand and to prepare for next year uh, better, uh, better lessons. Also, I remember at the beginning of 90s in Croatia, uh, when we were not part of this globalization and industry, then many of directors and presidents of the company, they didn't speak <coughs> English lesson and they don't care about that. <laughs> but when 1995-96, when the foreign companies start to invest in Croatia, then they completely change and they start to insist because they see that without English language they couldn't work with no one. For example, I also can state from my experience that I had one colleague. Uh, he was one, just a few of persons who can produce more than two ton, uh, millions of tons of cement. And he had a problem because he couldn't speak with his president of the board. And uh, at the beginning we solved that problem with translator. But later on, the uh, president of the board lose his patience because you couldn't have translator each moment and you know sometimes president call you around 10 in the evening and ask you because he is thinking something and then you have to be available and then we need to work with that person very very fast and also from industry that is very familiar that we are uh, promotion is very closely related with English language. And 
also English language and English courses is also some kind of reward, good workers and the sign of recognition that somebody, for example, is familiar with German, but then as a some kind of recognition and for future promotion, then we pay, for example, lessons in, I don't know, London or some other school. And so, also, by my experience, uh, one of the questions was uh, what is important, written or language? English, by my experience, it's much more important language because always we are writing, we are writing, everybody have a notebooks, computers, etc., etc. And then when you have to write, you have, you know, famous on a keyboard F7. So you can spell check without problem, even if you are not expert in English, but you need to be good in, in uh, communication. So this is from my side. I don't know if you have any further questions. So if I know, I will give you an answer. Any questions? I think I, I, I've sort of noted a couple of important issues there. Uh, that um, one of the last points made was that um, speaking is um, one of the crucial elements um, seen today uh, as many companies as for employment, for employment or for development. Yeah. And the other, of course, is the growing awareness of English and how the lack of appropriate skills can prevent people from, um, if you like, achieving what they would normally achieve. And indeed, I picked up on how um, it's very often emotional, how people feel, um, if you like, inadequate. Uh, if they're operating in an environment and very often in a multinational company and don't have the required skills. A <coughs> uh, question for Nico. Um, do you know how much is Croatia investing in intercultural communication? I don't know data about Croatia, but I know from my company and from my previous company that we were always have enough money for, for education because this is very well recognized, not just for languages, but for all others. And we have, for example, I don't know, around 1% of budget for, for education. question for you. Um, do you find that your uh, colleagues within your company are quite critical of the way um, their own colleagues speak English? Because I find when, um, when I have worked in Norway in the past, it's the Norwegians who are most critical about the Norwegian speaking of English and not the native speakers that they are dealing with in their business. We don't have that kind of problem, for example, here in, in Croatia, because it is, I don't know how to say, it. Uh, we don't make any difference for that. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. Thank you. Excuse me, I don't really have a, a question, but an observation. We've spent nine days here in Dubrovnik and in the surrounding area, and I've been extremely impressed with the excellent English of everyone in the hotel, the cashiers at the grocery store, the restaurants, and especially filling stations. You can see that the generation that's under 30 is go-getter, I'm going to make something of my country, 
a, a strong pride in what they're doing. And I've been very, very impressed. And I thought, this is the generation that we knew that is coming. I spoke to a receptionist, and she said, oh, I've had English since I was three. English is not really a foreign language. I can learn French and Italian as well. So French and Italian were, for her, the foreign languages, and English is like Croatian in the school system. So for us English teachers, this is a beginning of a new development where in future, most children will have English starting at the age of three at the latest. And I'm impressed that this development is, is very, very positive in our country. My comment only can be that you write here in area of tourism, immigration. <laughs> this is first of all, but also thanks uh, for the younger generation, which was born during the 90s also. They recognize the knowledge. They are familiar with English because they are on internet all the time. They are loading from computer, etc., etc. They are on a lot of web pages, Facebook, etc., etc. So they are pretty familiar with English. And also, in Cre I will say that the Croatian school system is very good because uh, English is a must actually in elementary school, then also in a high school, and also in own university. But I think that we have enough space for improving in the future, uh, not just for English, but I think that on university, uh, language, now I speak about English, but all the other language, needs to be improved knowledge. And with uh, many hours, I, I think that English is just on the first two years of university. And I also need uh, think that uh, this language needs to be much more specialized. For example, in economic, they need to be much more focused on finance, finance workings, etc., etc., bookkeeping, accounting, etc. What is related on this uh, university of of electrical, mechanical, electronic, they need also to be much more focused on, on this sort of business, not business, but specialized English language. Can, can I just ask a question myself? For your company, how do you work out for different job roles what specific English they need if you're giving them training, if they're going for training? How do you divide up the, the training? Is it by job role? Is it by level? Uh, each managerial working position, uh, knowledge of English is a must. This is first. And then also some, this is related and it is defined in job description. For each working position, your job is described and what skills you need to have. For example, I don't know, mechanical engineering, knowledge of English, knowledge of German, PC skills, some programs, mini tab, I don't know. Everything is related and even if it's not managerial position, some working position needs to be, you need to be fluent in English language. So everything is written in our systematization and organization chart. Hi, I come from the Croatian business world, so I will be just a little bit more critical about the English language and business world in Croatia. The problem is that most CVs, I don't know if that's the case in your company, uh, people just write that they are fluent in English. Uh, but maybe 70% of managers in Croatia are above 30s or 40s and, don't, and they don't speak English. So they are not able to even check what, that, what fluent English actually means in CV. So I think that's also uh, something that we should work on in the future, that this should be standardized in uh, CVs or uh, you know, certain certificates, certain levels. That's a huge problem because most CVs say I'm fluent in English. And what does that exactly mean if nobody's checking that out? 
So actually, that's my experience in the business world in Croatia. Actually, so. my role is to check that because I'm HR director. And of course, at that I didn't uh, just simply read CV and say, okay, he's fluent in English or whatever language is need. And we have a test. And for us, it's much more easier, for example, if you as a candidate, you give in your appendix, for example, Cambridge. Yeah, but that I, you like have I said, some kind of evidence, but this is also uh, uh, needs to be tested, yeah. of course. The big companies, I mean big companies in Croatia do that, but there are not so many big companies in Croatia. Most of them are just taking it for granted, fluent English, okay, fine. And I'm so, always happy, uh, were happy in the past because my CEO were always foreigners, so I didn't have a problem with, lucky you. His, <laughs> with his knowledge. Yeah, thank you. thank you. question would be, um, you said that uh, you invest about 1% of your overall budget, budget into education. Um, have you ever thought of um, having an, uh, an in-company trainer, somebody who would work only for you, an English trainer, or, or whether you hire uh, people from the side? We always, my experience is that we always hire uh, uh, professors from outside, from private schools mainly, because they work much more harder and they care <laughs> about results and we uh, always, as I told you before, uh, we always made a questionnaire so that we not will pay any, that we are not wasting the money without result because I will be guilty if anyone didn't improve his knowledge of English and so that's it. So Thank you. this is the my way of thinking and it is very uh, expensive to have hard professor just to, to teach the other. Okay, I think that's very interesting. Perhaps this is a topic we can pick up later. Um, and I, while I accept um, very much what the lady in the back says, I think this is probably a transition period as well, which um, does need um, perhaps some solution. But I also pick up what lives together, the level of English in, in, in this part of the world is very good. And uh, believe me, I travel to countries where they do start English at three and they never reach the level that I see in this particular part of the world. So again, you're quite right, congratulations to them. So we'll hand you over to you. Okay, if I stand on tiptoe, you should be able to see me as well, shouldn't you? Um, I'm going to be talking about the teacher training aspects here. Um, and my background to this is basically having done a lot of teacher training courses and um, uh, uh, different, different courses for business English teachers. And the questions that, that I've been asked to address is, well, what do we teach business English teachers? And also, you know, how can we ensure that we're going to keep in touch with actual business needs? Um, and probably before I begin, I should echo the points that Michael was, was making at the start, um, when he was talking about the diversity of students and classes that fall under Business English, um, the same thing goes on with Business English teachers. Um, you often find that you have teachers in Business English who have come in from a general English background and then others that have entered the profession from a Business English background. And here at this conference, I'm sure there are teachers from, from both areas. Somehow we get along, but it, we're diverse. Um, and then you, you'll find that there are um, experienced teachers who will be taking an MA course, um, but also, it's, and in fact, to take a Delta course, you've got to be experienced. Um, but also, you'll find inexperienced teachers taking MA courses, for example, or, or other, by inexperience, I mean without the experience of classroom practice. Um, 
The contexts in which business English teachers are working are very often. Michael mentioned it earlier, that important distinction between the pre-work and in-work learner and how different that can make our, the style of our classes in many ways. And um, another thing that's coming up now is um, with more and more courses being developed and delivered online or blended, um, you get the tech-savvy teachers and the tech enthusiasts and the less tech-savvy or just less enthusiastic or it just doesn't relate so much to the context in which they're working. Um, so when, when you've got a training provider trying to provide business English training courses, often on one course you will get teachers from all these different areas enrolling in the same course. But obviously their needs and perspectives are going to be rather different. Um, but ultimately, um, I mean, we're all working basically to develop the skills and abilities for our, of our learners to get things done effectively in an international workplace. So um, the ultimate goal is broadly speaking, hopefully the same, to develop the skills the students need in order to do business. Um, so what's available? Well, obviously, there's the Cambridge counter. There's the, Cam there's the Trinity Cert TESOL. These um, courses that so many teachers do that are well recognized, um, that, you, that include teaching practice, which must be valued, one would, one would think, by um, training managers, HR managers, who know what, the, who know what these, these certificates mean, if they're, if they're knowledgeable. And then, higher up, we have the Cambridge Delta and the um, Trinity Dip. Um, broadly speaking, or, and all four of these would involve teaching practice, of course. Now, um, these are basically general English courses. It's worth noting here that the Cambridge De Delta now has a module three, which can specialize in areas which are um, particularly relevant to business English teachers. It could be a business English specialism, it could be an ESP specialism, it could be a teaching one-to-one -one specialism. Um, but it's still only one, one third, if you like, of your DIP program. Um, and then we've got the more specialist business English courses. And I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar and may have done the LCCI <coughs> FTBE or the Trinity Cert IBET. Um, these two courses presume that you've already done a Kelta or a Trinity Cert. Um, preparation can be self-study, but, but basically we're talking about 40 to 60 hour courses here. These aren't high level qualifications, but they are specializing in business English. Um, the FTBE, you may have heard that called the first certificate for teachers of business English, <coughs> the further certificate, the foundation certificate, there's confusion over the name, and it's sort of morphed in, in different directions, in different ways over time. But these are the two core courses that are well recognized and well known to us. Um, I was talking to Mark Powell, who's done a lot of these, and his feeling is they're not, it's not enough. It's like it's a very basic introduction in some ways. Um, but they do cover a lot of things that we would probably recognize as being core in business English teaching. Um, needs analysis, course design, syllabus design. So many of us are designing that, those courses ourselves, and it, it's usually a crucial part of the syllabus. Um, adapting authentic materials in some way. So much more of a business English teacher's task, usually, than a general English teacher's task. Um, 
Business communication skills, often they'll feature things like meetings, presentations, this sort of thing, negotiations or whatever. Um, methods and approaches too will often be focused on in these courses, which would be um, often seen as best practice or an important part of the business English teacher's repertoire. So things like task-based learning, um, content and language integrated learning, um, lexical stuff, case studies, um, things that you probably wouldn't be spending so much time on in a general English course will get more attention here. And often there'll be some sort of component about basic English concepts and practices, but also how we're going to give feedback to our students, evaluate it, assess in the business English classroom. In a way, these are broad syllabuses. They're like tasting menus. But they're a, they're a great start for the business English teacher, perhaps for somebody who's switching over from general English to business English, or for people who have got their hands dirty already but want to think about it a little more deeply. But again, there's that issue that I was saying of um, that they are quite basic in some ways. Heck, they're only 50 hours long. You know, how much can you cover in that time? with a diverse group of business English trainers. Um, and then on top of that, um, we move on. Oh, yes, that's another point, obviously, that often comes up. Gosh, I've forgotten all these, haven't I? <laughs> um, right. Um, then there are the specialist courses. And they're often given by particular institutions in our industry. Um, I don't know, Adrian Pilbeam I've seen around at the conference. Um, at LTS in Bath, they do um, courses of designing and delivering intercultural training, for example. Jeremy Harmer, who we hope can make it to be here with us tomorrow for our plenary, uh, has worked for many years for York Associates. York Associates provide courses in cross-cultural training, um, and they themselves accredit teachers in using develop pe developing people internationally materials. This, these were materials that were developed initially for Henkel in Germany. Um, in addition, and this relates to the question I think that came up earlier from, from a, a gentleman there, there are also um, coaching accreditations that are often quite appropriate for business English teaching. And um, it was interesting for me on, on the plane over here yesterday, I sat next to Alison Hale and I said, how's business expecting to hear about the Business English Language School? She said, well, actually, Vicky, most of, us are doing, most of my work now is in coaching. Um, so there are sort of specialist routes that you can find people going off into doing, and that they can get training in via CTAR as well, if it's in um, intercultural training, or via coaching or whatever. <coughs> And then, and I don't know if, if there are people here who are contemplating doing it, there are, of course, master's level courses, so degree programs. Um, now, they're generally more academic in content, obviously. Um, and in my experience, as I mentioned earlier, the students who are going on those courses won't all necessarily be practitioners at the time of doing the course. If you're coming from a European route, you will probably have several years of business English teaching under your belt before you'll be doing it. However, many American teachers, for example, would do their first degree and then do a master's immediately. So you could often find there's quite a mishmash, that diversity again, in the group of teachers taking those courses. Um, Another thing about the master's level courses is, with the exception of the University of Birmingham, an ESP component is usually just one bit of the course. So you'll be doing your master's course on all sorts of aspects of applied linguistics and English language teaching probably, but only one section of that course might focus on ESP. Um, and. Um, and then within that, there's this other peculiar thing that can go on at universities, which is because they have a lot of um, tutors who are 
who are very skilled in teaching EAP, so English for academic purposes, very often that will form a large component of the ESP course. Um, so it tends to be more focused on written skills, on, um, on genre, and that, that, those sorts of aspects of ESP. Um, so if you're doing a master's course, I mean, you might want to inquire about that. If you're engaged in in-company teaching and you're looking at that course, you might want to just check how much of it is EAP, how much of it is ESP. And I think we see that reflected in the research literature as well that we're using when we're teaching on those courses. Um, there was a study by Joe McDonough uh, of um, the ESP journal, I think in, 90, uh, in 2008. She looked at all the articles on ESP in the ESP journal, and 85% of them were actually about EAP. If you wanted to learn about business English teaching and business English aspects of communication there, you would probably want instead be going off to look at things like pragmatics or, or the business, um, business journals. Um, so, in terms of the higher level qualifications, we start to, to, to go off and become diverse. Um, you might think, well, you know, why not? Oops, where have I gone? I'm looking for the... Huh. Okay, I was just, just thinking of the delta. You might think, well, why can't we have a very a pure, purely business English delta or something like that? Um, for most exam boards, the, the diploma level qualifications are actually a loss leader. They're not things that they're making money on. So it's, it's hard to get, it's hard to fund these courses. Um, the money can be made at perhaps at the cert level, but the number of people wanting the advanced, taking the advanced level qualifications starts getting quite small. Um, Okay, so meeting needs. Um, where am I? <laughs> if I go like this, oh yes, okay. Um, I mean, there is this question there of, you know, are we meeting the needs and staying in touch with what companies and what businesses want when we're doing teach training for business English? Um, I, I don't think I can answer it. But there are some issues, I think, that come up and are worth thinking about when we look at it. Um, something that that's comes up again and again, I think, in business English teacher training all the time is it's easy to think that teaching business English is a matter of talking about business English. It isn't. For our students, that's not what they want to do. They actually want to do business. So it's the language that you need to do business that has to be, we have to be helping them with. And this applies in the teacher training as well. That, you know, you don't want courses that are teaching you about business English necessarily. You want the courses that are going to help you to teach the skills that are going to do it. <laughs> um, okay, and then, um, I think if Evan were here, unfortunately he couldn't get on the plane to be here, but I'm sure I've, I'm, I've heard him go on about this so often, and he's, but he's so right about it. You know, the communities of practice in which our students operate are things that we do not know about. We cannot know all we need to know about them, but we can hopefully go off and search for them. And I think that that is something that you can do particularly on MA courses, because one of the pluses of MA courses is you suddenly get um, the ability to go off and read the research papers. And it's not just research papers into linguistics and the ESP journal. This is research papers into intercultural issues, into business journals, into pragmatics, and all sorts of other things that relate to our field. Um, and and I think I'm nearly finished, and I can get off and finish spot on time. So, yes, research matters, and to follow that research. Oh, the other important thing is corpus research, and learning to do corpus research, that you can, that again, can be encompassed in those higher level studies. 
And I think that's very relevant to us because in order to keep track of what language those discourse communities are using and what language skills our students need, we do need to be looking at the corpus, particularly the spoken corpus. Um, because as Nico said, usually speaking is the top priority skill. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Any questions you have to raise there? Just to refresh my own memory in years, I also uh, kept some notes regarding um, keeping in touch with business English needs. I think that's a, a really important issue. And technology and how that impacts on um, both the providers of training and the trainers and on the learners themselves. And specialization, and how that is, if you like, at least creeping into certain courses. Um, and that some courses, they do provide relevant content for teachers of business English, although that may very often be a fraction of, of the entire course. And of course, valuable points on research and doing uh, versus talking about. So are there any questions for Vicky? Um, I'm not sure it's a, a question so much. I just was reflecting being a new teacher. Um, I feel that I'm very lucky because obviously I grew up in my parents' business so I feel very comfortable in the business environment. And I've commented before that we view with our teachers that actually a business background is as important as their linguistic ability. Um, because, you know, experience is very hard to come by. I guess I'm just interested in your view on the balance of training. It struck me that you were saying about the diplomas being very much less popular than the certificate. And I'm already itching to get onto the diploma, but I've got to teach for at least another year before I'm able. Um, and you've made me want to do a specialist qualification now, frankly. But I just, um, having relatively recently gone through the CELTER, um, and in my experience, despite doing what I think is probably one of the best courses for Zelda that you can do in the UK, um, I didn't feel at all prepared linguistically, at all. And I don't think that many people on my course were. And I certainly, had I not already been familiar with the business English environment, I certainly don't think I would have um, been any good at all, had I not, fortunately, had language teachers and parents. Um, should there, with the CELTA, should there be a different um, balance right from the off about how we prepare students for different environments? Because the CELTA is very, very generic, really, and a lot of PPP. And you know, it, do we need to be doing more to input with our teachers before we send them into different environments? It's actually really hard. I mean, teachers on the CELTA course work their socks off. Um, just imagine, you've got a group of people in front of you who've never taught before, and over the next 80, uh, is it 80 hours? I've forgotten. Um, 120, I've forgotten. You are going to teach them how to teach English. Phew! I mean, it's a heck of a job they do. Um, and in a way, it's an impossible task. And I kind of see it, you know, like I mentioned, it was like almost a taster menu that you get on the CERTI, BET and the LCCI, Business English one. I think on a Kelter course, it's almost like a, a crash ABC that hopefully will enable you to hold yourself together through the first week of your classes so that you can go off at the weekend and hopefully study to do the next seven <laughs> week. And, and maybe what we really need to be thinking about and focusing on at all levels is some programs for continuing professional development um, that would be taken over time gently, but particularly, you know, as a support after something like a Kelter course. You have to help that the hope that the people who have just got off a Kelter course are going into a warm, supportive classroom <laughs> who will be there with lots of tender loving care to love them through it. Thank yeah. you, that's a great answer. And the, the continuing professional development resonates very much with my engineering background. And yeah, I think seeing more of that would be fantastic. Thank you. Well, 
we take just this question and then move on and any other questions we take at the end? Is that okay? Yeah, please go ahead. Hello. Um, I wanted to pick up on one of the last things you said about the spoken corpus <coughs> and ask you, uh, do you have any practical suggestions for um, business English teachers, how they can sort of implement that in their practice? Like take inspiration, take ideas from the spoken corpus? It's actually, what, what the, one of the problems, I think, for business English teachers is that unless you do an MA, you usually don't have access to the research on it. However, there is, the, the, the tool that I'm using is Wordsmith, and it enables me to go out and grab, and it's very hard to get the hold of spoken corpora yourself, but for example, if you're teaching, I don't know, en engineers studying a particular thing, you can go off and get lots of text on that, put it in there, and it's amazing what you can find from the searches. There was a guy who I saw in London a little while ago, and I'm awfully sorry, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's another corpus tool that's free. Um, but there are also corpora around on the web. Just go in, poke around and look at them. The Brigham Young one, is a good one. Mm -hmm. And the voice corpus is very interesting. That's the international mm -hmm. English one. Yeah. Um, and if you're linguistically curious, which of course we all are, because we're language teachers, they could be um, great places to go and, and check things and look at them and, and, and see them. Um, but some, there are, some, of course, some other nice texts around on spoken corpus. And we're seeing more textbooks come out that reflect some of the research that's been, and the results that have been thrown up from research in them. But it's not like it's an easy one to just go and play with no. otherwise, you know. It's Thank you. Thank you very much.